I'm going to spend just a moment here talking about managing alligator weed in the fall. Alligator weed is most commonly a problem in rice, um, but it's also a problem in ponds, and it's also a problem, occasional problem in, in sweet potatoes. And now when we think about ponds and we think about sweet potatoes, especially in sweet potatoes, there's only one way to control it. There are no herbicides that we can apply in sweet potatoes in crop that will selectively control alligator weed. Now while we have herbicides in rice that will selectively control it, it takes multiple applications in crop. Same thing in ponds. We can manage it in the spring with selective herbicides in ponds, but it takes multiple applications. Now what's nice about it, or what's neat about alligator weed is that it's very, very sensitive to a quart or to a pound of glyphosate in the fall. Um, we can apply, you know, sometime between mid-September to the mid-October, we can make one application and get 80, 90 percent control for out as much as out as a year to two years, depending on on the conditions, but um, that's the best time to manage it. The easiest time to manage it is in the fall. One other issue I'd like to take the opportunity to talk about right now would be how to manage some of the broadleaf weeds. The most common practice is to spray glyphosate on these fields to try to clean up the grasses. But what we're going to end up doing is creating a glyphosate resistant weed. Now this, act this actually is spiny amaranth, which is a very close cousin to palmer amaranth and water hemp that you've heard a lot about uh, with glyphosate resistance. So this is an excellent way to select for it. So when we've got broadleaf weeds, things like spiny amaranth or palmer amaranth or vine or tea weed, which would be the biggest problem that we have in soybeans right now, we're going to have to add something to the glyphosate. To date, the best thing has been lay by pro to control tea weed. Now for the pig weeds, I don't know, we may have to do something a little more strong, you know, even consider a dicamba or a 2,4-D type application. We'll have to watch and make sure we're within the uh, rules for m making aerial applications of that. So. Good afternoon, my name is Bill Williams. I'm the uh, Extension Weed Specialist with the LSU Ag Center. I work out of the Scott Research and Extension Center in Winsboro, Louisiana. Um, I'm here today to talk about fall weed management. And the reason we want to talk about fall weed management because it is the primary reason that we're seeing an increase in problems in managing annual grasses such as what we see here in this cornfield, uh, tea weed. It's also going to be a major player with glyphosate resistant weeds. It's just you know, after we harvest corn and after we harvest soybeans, we've got to start cleaning up these fields. And that's really what we want to talk about. Uh, if you look at this field, it's been sprayed with glyphosate. You can already see, we've already set seed on the, uh, this is broadleaf signal grass, a major weed and pearl irrigated corn. Yeah. And the only way we're actually going to be able to clean these fields up is as soon as, as soon as possible after harvest, these fields need to be mowed so you can re reduce the vegetation, spread it out so the weeds aren't covered up, so that when we make these glyphosate applications, we're going to actually accomplish something. One other issue on that while we're talking about it is that glyphosate is generally the herbicide of choice for, for trying to clean up a field. It's not going to do a very good job on large weeds, large tea weed, large pig weeds, such as the pig weed behind us. Um, we're going to need something more along the lines of laid by pro and really and truly that's that's basically what has been our most successful program is glyphosate plus laid by pro in corn. Now when we talk about fall weed management there's really three areas in fall weed control that we have an opportunity to work in and the first one we've already talked a little bit about is the summer annuals the things that we have coming up after harvest in corn and soybeans. The other would be the perennials weeds, things like Johnson grass, uh, alligator weed, and red vine. Now with those we found in our, in our research is that the only time to really manage those well would be in mid-September to mid-October. Once you get past mid-October, a fall application of glyphosate or dicamba or whatever it may be is not going to do very well. Prior to the mid-September, uh, mid, 
September, we don't have any effect from those herbicides as well. Now the other one for corn growers that we're really concerned about would be things like ryegrass, henbit, the cool season weeds. Now that's the biggest threat to corn production are our cool season weeds. Well, the best time to manage those with the fall application is going to be in November. If we put something out much prior, you know, prior to that, the herbicide dissipate before the weeds start to come up and we have really no effect there. So when you're looking at it, you got three types of weeds that we need to control. You got your summer annuals, you got your perennials, and you got your cool season weeds. The summer annuals we need to control as soon as possible after harvest. The perennials we want to wait to mid-September and get that application out by mid-October. And then with our uh, cool season weeds, we want to wait till the first of November. Any time after November is, is a pretty good application timing there. Now, obviously, we can't do all three of those applications in a year, so you're really going to have to choose which problem, what is your problem. For corn, the biggest threat to corn right now is glyphosate-resistant ryegrass. So, I mean, if you've got, a rye, you've got a field that's infested in ryegrass and you're wanting to control, grow corn in it, you need to look at a fall program designed to control ryegrass, which would start in November. If you're dealing with things like teaweed and soybeans or cotton, we need to look at coming in and cleaning up things after harvest. Same thing with soybeans. Another method that we use to determine a proper timing for defoliation is based on the heat unit accumulation within the plant. See this plant right here has a white flower at this particular node. Essentially what you're looking at is a stage of four nodes on the cotton plant above this white flower. Here we go, one, two, three, four nodes. We're at four nodes above white flower essentially on this plant. This plant is considered at, at cutout at this, this particular point. Now to determine your proper defoliation, you want to identify this particular growth stage of your cotton. When you're four nodes above white flower, you want to start adding up your heat units you accumulated each day. As I mentioned, the, to determine the amount of heat units that are accumulated, you take the daily high temperature plus the daily low temperature, you divide that number by two, and you subtract 60 from that number. 60 is the temperature at which cotton is effectively not growing, so you're subtracting uh, 60 from the number that you do calculate. You want to keep track of those over several days. The number of heat units you're looking at is 850 heat units beyond this node above white flower 4 growth stage. At that particular point, you're safe to put out your defoliation if you maximize yields. Now in Louisiana, we have conducted research where we have shown in some instances, instances we can go beyond this 850 heat unit, unit accumulation based on the, the temperature, the higher temperatures we sometimes get on into uh, sept through the month of September. So our research has shown on some occasions you can go all the way to 1050, 1050 heat units beyond this node above white flower forward stage and maximize yields. But most of the time, this node above white flower four plus 850 heat units is going to be the proper time for your defoliation to maximize yield. Another timing for defoliation is based on the percent open that the crop is at that time. And if you looked at most harvest aid labels, the timing for defoliation application is going to be at 60% open bowl. As I said, you're focusing on the open part of the crop, so to determine a 60% open bowl is just very easy. You're just looking at a ratio of the amount of bowls over the plant that are open versus the total bowls across the plant. If that is 60%, generally you're safe to defoliate. And often we run into situations like this where you have cotton bowls open down toward the bottom of the plant on 60% of the plant. The bowls at the top are mature. If you would cut these open with a knife, you would see the darkening of the seed coat. They are mature and still need to be open. Obviously, you don't want to let the open part of the crop at the bottom be exposed to environmental conditions such as rain, so you kind of want to speed up these bowls at the top and go ahead and pop them open. It's situations like this where in addition to putting out materials that will defoliate and take off the leaves of the cotton, you also want something that will speed up the bowl opening. Anything that contains ethophon, like a prep, a super bowl, or a finished pro, materials like that contain 
uh, uh, ethophon, which will go ahead and ripen the bowl and cause it to pop open. So you're looking at sort of two things in a situation like this, compounds that are effective at defoliating, taking off the leaves, but also opening the bowls as well. Now cotton defoliation has been referred to more as an art than a science because it's one part of the growing season and growing cotton that is very susceptible to environmental conditions. Changing environmental conditions can infect the, the uh, recipe, if you will, that you put out for successful cotton defoliation. Now one of the questions that we get every year concerning defoliation of cotton is the, how much contribution to yield do we have these bowls at the top? Do I need to wait on these, these bowls at the top to mature on out? Uh, and what we have found is we've looked at a lot of, of uh, data over the years, uh, looking at plant mapping data, and what we have found that generally in Louisiana, about 95% of the cotton yield is contributed over a 12 known range of the plant. In other words, the majority of the, the yield you're going to get that you're going to get paid for will occur over a 12 node range of the plant and actually the nodes at the top will not contribute that much toward yield. In order to be able to use the 12 node rule, essentially what you're doing is you're locating the, the lowest first position bowl that you can reasonably expect to harvest. You count 12 nodes up from that particular point. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, up to the 12th node. Now, any bowl on this 12 node range of the plant that I just counted will contribute significantly to yield, over 95% of your cotton yield. And once you reach that 12th node, the decision whether it's safe to defoliate or not becomes a visual inspection. So what you do is uh, any bowl at that 12th node, you will cut it in cross section with a knife and you want to visually inspect the seed. And what you're looking for essentially is the edges around the seed. Once that seed coat starts darkening, then that bowl is considered mature and safe from defoliation. You will not harm yield. You see the bowls on the outside right here form this dark ring around the seed coat. These bowls are mature enough to go ahead and defoliate and you will have no negative effect on yield at that point. Every node above this 12 node range will have very little contribution toward yield. And essentially what you're doing is you obviously have more mature bowls at the bottom of the plant. They're gonna open a lot sooner than these bowls above this 12 node range right here. So you're, what you're doing is you're exposing the open bowls, the open cotton to weathering, to more rain. You can run into quality issues and perhaps disease issues as well. So it's not always wise to wait on the small bowls at the top because there's very little contr contribution to yield. Now in situations where you may have have had some insect problems or, or some environmental conditions which caused some fruit shed in the middle of this plant, you may have a fruiting gap. In other words, you'll have bowls toward the bottom of the plant and then nodes kind of in the middle of the plant will not have any fruit and you'll start having fruit toward the top of the plant. In situations like this, then you may want to extend that 12 node rule on up to have these bowls at the top contribute to yield to make up for the fruit that's missing in the middle of the plant. Each year we see situations like we've had environmental conditions the past few days where our temperatures have reached above 100 and we've had heat indexes in the 110s and the 110s. We're under situations like this where we had earlier planting cotton and you see essentially as I mentioned the, the cotton plant operates off the amount of heat units it accumulates. So the, to calculate the amount of heat units that this plant is, is accumulating, essentially it's a formula where you take the daily high temperature plus the daily low temperature, you divide that by two and you subtract 60 from that number. Now 60 is the temperature at which cotton is not actively growing. So you subtract uh, 60 from the number that you get from that calculation and that's how many heat units that the plant has accumulated during that day. In situations where we're running the temperatures well into the hundreds, where a lot of times we are accumulating 25, 30 heat units, and it can often make this plant accelerate and, and really mature fast. And we're in situations like this, where essentially every bowl on the plant has opened. Now in a defoliation situation like that, 
you obviously don't need any help in opening those bowls. Mother Nature has done the job for you with the heat units that she's applying to that plant. But a lot of times we get the question of the addition of compounds that help to mature the bowls or pop the bowls open. Now, there's a chemical ethophon in materials such as PrEP and Super Bowl, materials like this that help in producing ethylene to go ahead and mature the bowl, pop the bowl open. Now, they do not aid in 